Hello and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Uh, we're coming towards the end of the book of the prophet Amos. Uh, and so let's press on with it. Lord, open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your work. In the name of Christ our Lord and by the working of your spirit. Amen. Last week we took a little time to consider uh, the clash between uh, Amos and Amaziah. Amaziah being the priest of Bethel and how he played his, uh, I suppose, his political card, uh, his position in the religious political interface at the court of uh, King Jeroboam II. Uh, and he's threatening Amos to go away home uh, and stop this. Uh, we didn't get on to the second part, probably because I'm a waffler. I apologize. So Amos chapter 7 verse 14. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but was a shepherd. I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. Okay, we looked at that, the first part of his reply. And really, um, what follows has a, a chapter break as we go into chapter 8. I think it all has to be taken as a whole, as if there is no chapter break. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the house of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up and you yourself will die in a pagan country. And Israel will certainly go into exile away from their native land. This is what the sovereign Lord said, showed me. A basket of ripe fruit. What do you see, Amos? He asked. A basket of ripe fruit, I answered. Then the Lord said to me, the time is ripe for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, the songs in the temple will turn to wailing. Many, many bodies flung everywhere. Silence. Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over that we might sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat, skimping the measure, boosting the price and cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy with a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob I will never forget anything they have done. Will not the land tremble for this and all who live in it mourn? The whole land will rise like the Nile. It will be stirred up and then sink like the river of Egypt. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious feasts into mourning and all your singing into weeping. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make the time like mourning for the only son and the end of it like a bitter day. The days are coming, declares the Lord, while I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from the north to the east searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. In that day, the lovely young women and strong young men will faint because of thirst. They who swear by the shame of Samaria, or say, as surely as your God lives, O Dan, or as surely as the God of Beersheba lives, they will fall, never to rise again. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the tops of the pillars, bring them down on the heads of all the people. Those who are left I will kill with the sword. Not one will get away, none will escape. Though they dig down to the depths of the grave, from there my hand will take them. Though they climb up to the heavens, from there I will bring them down. 
Though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide from me at the bottom of the sea, I will command the serpent to bite them. Though they are driven into exile by their enemies, there I will command the sword to slay them. I will fix my eyes upon them. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, who touches the earth and it melts, and all who live, live in it mourn, the whole land rises like the Nile, then sinks like the river of Egypt. He who builds the lofty palace in the heavens and sets its foundations on the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them over the face of the land, the Lord is his name. Are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord? Did I not bring Israel from Egypt, the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Armenians from Ker? Surely the eyes of the sovereign Lord are on the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For I will give my hand and I will shake the house of Israel from the nations as grain is shaken in a sieve and not a pebble will reach the ground. All the sinners among my people will die by the sword. All who say disaster will not overtake or meet us. I'm going to stop there. It's, uh, it's actually not as long as it sounded, I hope. Uh, chapter 8 is... Uh, 14 verses and we've read the first 10 so that was 24 verses and it's all of a piece it's all one thing uh, we, we don't need to go through uh, the catastrophes as such uh, that will befall them uh, one verse at a time you can read that for yourself uh, it's pretty uh, horrifying stuff uh, that is being said to them why why is the Lord God displeased with them? Why is he angered with them? We've touched on this a number of times and we have another explanation. And I do want us to take a little time to look at um, chapter 8 uh, and verses, uh, where are we? Verse uh, 5 and 6. Verse 5 and 6. Uh, sorry, 4, 5 and 6. Hear this, you who trample the needy, and do away with the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath be ended, that we may market wheat, skimping the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver, and the needy with a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. What is abundantly clear in uh, God's message is that his great displeasure is being visited upon his people because of their corruption. They have corrupted their spirituality by the raising of an idol. They have further corrupted their spirituality and maybe more deeply corrupted their spirituality by considering that they are God's uh, chosen people. And that's enough. They don't need to... Uh, to do anything uh, to bring glory to God. Indeed, they've assumed they may live their lives in whatever manner they ha have chosen. Uh, and uh, the manner they have chosen uh, seems to be the, the classic part of the human condition. And that is, of course, that we go to the lowest common denominator. Water is a fascinating thing, isn't it? Uh, if you spill water, uh, it will find its level. If water leaks, it will find its level. If water suddenly appears from somewhere, uh, it has got there from somewhere else. It's been topped up and it will find its way. Uh, water will, will just make its way to wherever it wants to go. Uh, and of course, water is this extraordinary... Um, commodity in the creation of the world uh, uh, we uh, just this amazing stuff that uh, we take in this country for granted that we have this abundance uh, this super abundance of water to do whatever we like with uh, uh, and so on and yet we know that water let loose uh, will go its own way and cause mayhem and destruction I remember when I was uh, living 
in Jordanstown in um, a small suburban uh, development uh, off the Jordanstown Road. Uh, the hills nearby were um, uh, Carnmoney, Cave Hill, Carnmoney Hill, and then across uh, uh, towards uh, Naka. Uh, and uh, right across there you had what's called a microclimate. And one evening around uh, dinner time, uh, around about half five, six o'clock, there was a cloudburst. Uh, the most ferocious, short-lived thunderstorm. Flashes of, thun flashes of lightning, bangs of thunder. And the rain came down, probably the heaviest rain, I've poss possibly the heaviest rain I've ever seen in this country. And uh, our street turned into... A small river and uh, luckily we were high up on the Jordanstown Road so it went streaming away from us but there was one garden further down on, on a corner site not terribly far away but less than a hundred yards I think uh, where the water had gone on down the road but it also uh, s some several hundreds if not a thousand gallons of water or whatever I don't know had gone into the garden as well gathered in a small swimming pool and knocked the wall down. Uh, really quite extraordinary. And it only lasted half an hour at the very, very most. But it caused such destruction. It caused absolute mayhem and destruction. Water finds its level. Human behaviour finds its level. And left... Without any moral compass, we will find a level which is the lowest common denominator. Uh, that is, I guess, what we uh, refer to as, uh, in the words of Calvin, total depravity. That doesn't mean we are utterly depraved. It means that we have this balance or imbalance in us that, that, that means we find a level. Uh, we find a level. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching bowls on television. I most certainly have not been watching bowls, but I do know from having a go at bowls uh, that a bowl, a, bo a bowling ball, not the sort that you use for 10 pin, a bowling ball has a built-in bias. And if you bowl it with your left hand, you have to make sure the bias is on the correct side so the bowl will uh, bend in the direction that you want it to go. And similarly, you turn it the other way when you're bowling with your right hand. So uh, a built-in bias is what is meant by the total depravity, that there is this bias into one side and we will find the lowest common denominator. The people of the ten tribes of Israel have abandoned the law of God and accepted the idea of the covenant. And we abandon aspects of the teaching of uh, the law, the prophets, of Christ our Lord and the Apostles at our peril. We need to know what our faith is and what it teaches and not just know it as head knowledge but endeavour in the power of the Spirit of God to live it out. And they had taken their status as the covenant people of God, the people who were delivered into the promised land whom, to whom God had shown great favour and now they're in a time of great prosperity. All is well with my soul Everything's grand uh, and we're okay. We're the special ones. We're the elect of God. We're his people. And they think that's okay. And they've been misbehaving. Misbehaving in a number of ways. Indulging their materialism. Uh, slouching about on uh, ivory beds and couches. And uh, drinking bowls of wine. And, and feasting and feeding day and night and they've been doing it at the expense of others they have been exploiting the poor and trampling uh, over them and they're even when they come to their religious ceremonies the new moon ceremony and, and the sabbath day they're kind of pawing the ground like a you see a bull pawing the ground waiting to 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 
gallop off. They're, they're, they're revving their engines, to use another metaphor, revving their engines, wanting to get away ahead and, and get out of, of, of there and go and uh, make merry and also make, create chaos in the lives of those who are less fortunate to themselves. When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended? that we may market wheat. There's nothing wrong with selling grain and marketing wheat. Super, yeah, you need commerce, uh, you need an income, you need to, to work hard uh, on those things. Uh, but skimping the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales. If ever you or I are Tempted to think these things are too small. These things haven't sensed the Almighty. Why? God has called his people to the highest possible standards. God has called his covenant people to live according to a law that he gave them. And within the law of the Old Testament, there are irreproachable and incomparable standards of justice and compassion for the poor, the needy and the vulnerable in society. If you read the book of Ruth, you will find uh, Ruth and Naomi uh, come to back into Canaan. And what do they do? Because they are poor, they go to where the harvest is being taken and the law has stated that the gleanings be left for the poor, that when taking the harvest, the farmer does not get into every corner of the field, but rather leaves some of the crop available in the corners of the field and in the very centre of the field. And then the poor are to be able to come in and help themselves. That is the law of God. I didn't make it up. Amos didn't make it up. It's in the law. And in the law, that is enshrined. What are they doing? They're skimping the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales. It matters. Why? Because it is unjust. What does God hate? Injustice. God also hates hypocrisy. People who are in the place of worship and all they can think about is, I can't wait to get out there and fleece as many people as possible. Dishonest trading, dishonest dealing. And this has implications for those of us who consider ourselves to be in a covenant relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How, how, how do I deal with other people? If you are in business, are you honest? If I am trading, am I honest? I am allowed to make a profit. You are allowed to make a profit. That's how you make a living. You invest, you purchase or you plant and sow. You produce, you manufacture, you handle goods. And in the handling of all those things, you make a profit, you pay your taxes and you feed your family. And the cycle goes round again. Not a thing wrong with that. Until we start to be unjust. Until we start to cheat. Until we start to bend the rules. Bending the rules is something that has caused many millions of us to be massively aggravated and angry with Boris Johnson and his party set in uh, Downing Street. But it's also causing us to be highly suspicious of the oil companies and gas companies and electricity companies who while on the one hand are saying it's not our fault are making more money in a quarter of this year than they made in the whole of last year. And you can't help feeling that you're being done over. But am I doing anybody over? Are you doing anybody over? Are we assuming that because Jesus is my Lord, I am immune to sin. 
And we must not think that way. They thought that way and they thought it was all right to go out and cheat people. They thought it was all right to have uh, rigged their scales. They thought it was all right and they were doing it. There is a massive implication for those of us who live in the prosperous countries of this world. And so much of the world's great resources and riches are being taken from countries where people have nothing so that I might be comfortable. And now that we're facing into a time of discomfort, possibly being cold and not having the same amount to eat and drink that we would have had to eat and drink last year and the year before, because there is a crisis, a war, and, and all these things, we are uh, concerned, and rightly concerned. Some people, you listen to some of the reports of the plight of some people in our own country, and it's a disgrace in our country that we need food banks. I keep saying this. It's a disgrace, but they are there, and we should support them. I sit here in Bestbrook in South Armagh in beautiful surroundings and a nice house provided for me by uh, the church. Nice grounds, nice people, a prosperous society by world standards. And I might ask myself, you know, where does that comfort come from? It comes at the expense of other people. What do I now do about that is the question. Well, I could, can, should and must campaign for justice in the world for everybody. That our trade and commerce is done justly and with fairness uh, and that sort of fair trade sort of mentality. That's a, a starting point. But we won't be able to address all of the issues straight off. But we mustn't just say, well, I, I can't do anything and put our hands up. Many charities exist to give us a conduit to bless other people who are less fortunate than ourselves. To give what of what we have to the blessing of the poor and the needy and, and the, the lost and the lonely, the homeless, the stranger, the broken, the addicted, the, the alcoholic, the, the you know, uh, people who are refugees, all those things. There are plenty of opportunities. The Lord knows that I can't, with a turn of my hand, stop the firm that I buy my coffee from maybe being an honest or dishonest firm. I hope they're honest. I hope the people they deal with are dealt with in an honest and upright and just manner. But I can seek out organisations whereby I can give support. We mustn't be negligent. And where we can ensure and can oversee that we are people of justice and mercy and compassion, we are called to do so. Remember the verse from uh Malachi, the prophet Malachi, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Let us be those people. Buying the poor with silver and the needy with sandals, selling them even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, pride of Jacob they think that they are special you know it's a great country for the pride of this and the pride of that the pride of Jacob I will never forget anything they have done and then the warnings recommence uh, and they are dire dire warnings the instrument, the agency of God's judgment is to be the empire of the Assyrians. This is what the Lord has said, that the Assyrians will come and strike them down and no matter what they try to do to avoid it, they will not avoid it. I'm going to finish looking at the text by reading uh, the last five or six verses of the book of the prophet Amos. 
And in this translation, which is the New International Version, there's a heading that says, Israel's Restoration. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from the hills. I will bring back my exiled people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. Uh, I will plant I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Let us start from modern times and work backwards. It's very, very easy. Uh, after the foundation of the state of Israel in 1948, for us to go back into this type of prophecy and say, there you are, there you are, there you are, Israel, Israel, Israel's is back in the land, they're permanently there. This is the fulfillment of God's prophecy to Amos. There may be a truth in that. I am neither for nor against the state of Israel. I completely get that after a millennia of persecution, which culminated in the most hideous deeds of what's coming around to nearly a century ago, the rise of the Third Reich and the appalling Holocaust that was visited upon the Jewish people. Do you know something? If I was Jewish, I'd be looking at Israel and saying, I'm going there, there's a safe place for me there, we'll build a sanctuary and we'll guard it. And they're never again will they come out get us. They may come after us, but never again will they get us. Sympathy, empathy, I completely understand that. And I am not dismissive of the prophecies at all. But let us be have a care that we just don't willy nilly pluck things out and say, There it is, there, there it is, there, there it is, there. There's an awful lot of that goes on in the modern church. I have great sympathy. Israel Modern Israel, like every state and every people, must conduct itself with justice, righteousness and compassion. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. I dare say there are things that Israel has done in the last 60 years uh, that are false accusations have been made against them. I dare say there are things that Israel have done that horrify me. Okay? Uh, and there are things that need to be revisited in my mind. So I don't, I don't feel that as a Christian in the Western world, I am called upon to be a, a supporter of any state or, or government uh, without check or balance. I mean, that's how a lot of Christians got themselves into trouble uh, during the Third Reich. It's our duty to support the government. And they just let stuff happen or actively engaged with helping it happen. We're not obliged to be cheerleaders for everybody in every circumstance all the time. So yes, at one level, I have great admiration for uh, the modern state of Israel. Uh, otherwise, I'd sort of go, ah, what on earth is happening there, you know? It's complicated. This country where I live in is complex and complicated. Uh, and, and the affairs of humanity are complex and complicated. So I don't believe this is speaking of, uh, you know, the founding of the State of Israel in 1948-49. Or the rise of Zionism and the hundred years and that before that. This is in the context of the day. That's looking at it from here back to there. Let's go back to there. And there is a term used here that you'll find elsewhere in your Old Testament uh, that the Lord refers, uh, refers to so that they may possess the remnant 
of Edom. This is an idea that you find in Amos, you find in other of the prophets, what theologians, Bible scholars refer to as the righteous remnant. That among all the injustice, all the cheating, all the idol worship, all the turning away from the precepts of the law uh, and saying we have the covenant and living hypocritically and indulging themselves, all that stuff. And among all the judgment and the darkness that is being visited upon them uh, in the name of the Lord and the sword that is coming upon the land, that in there there is always a nugget of hope and promise and blessing and a people that are always referred to as the righteous remnant. The people who lived the life. The people who worshipped the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul and with all their mind and loved their neighbour as themselves. The people who uh, would have heard the word of Amos and gone, yeah, I completely agree with what this man's saying. This is frightful. What he is saying is frightful, but it's only frightful because we as a nation have behaved in a frightful manner. And they are known as the righteous remnant. People who have endeavoured with all their heart to live faithfully. And that is the call for you and for me, to live faithfully according to what God has called us to be. Children of the living God by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are called to live lives that are empowered and formed and are lived to the best of our equipment to be righteous, holy before him. And these people are referred to back there as the righteous remnant. There is a danger in among the, the smaller um, fundamentalist sects and cults uh, that beset us to the left and the right that they all consider themselves to be the righteous remnant. I can't say if I'm the righteous remnant. You can't say I'm the righteous remnant. All we can do is be faithful. Faithful in worship, faithful in devotion, and above all, faithful in living out the life that we have been called to. And God says again and again, when these dire prophecies befall his children Israel, uh, in the time of Amos, Hosea, and the other prophets of what we call the Old Testament, when these prophecies are given that there are those who are faithful and remain there is always something that there's attention drawn to. Elijah the prophet won a great conquest. He threw down the worship of Baal and was blessed. And then his heart failed him and he ran away. He ran and he ran and he ran and he hid in a cave. And then he had... Uh, what we call a theophany, an encounter, a physical encounter with the presence of God. And he cried from his heart, I only I am left in Israel. And the Lord showed him that there were 6,000 faithful people. And we can sometimes look around us and say, where are the faithful, where are the people who worship the Lord? And the Lord has a reassuring word, there is always a righteous remnant. There are always people who live for him. And it's not always the people who shout loudest. It's not always the people who are, you know, croaking on about their testimony and how they lived in darkness and now they live in light. That's the testimony of every Christian. We all lived in darkness and now we live in light. That's the, the testimony of humankind, that the light of God has shone forth in Christ Jesus and the darkness was not able to overwhelm it. And darkness will never overwhelm the light of God. The light of God is in our lives and we strive to live according to his will and his way in our prayer life and by his grace and mercy, daily devoting ourselves to being faithful Christian people. God has mercy because of his remnant. And because there's a remnant, there is mercy in the prophecy. Right at the very end, just a handful of verses, right at the very end, there will be restoration because of the remnant. But for the bulk of the children of Israel in the northern kingdom of Israel, this prophecy came true. About 50 years later, the Assyrian Empire fell on them, bore them off, 
who knows where. And they ceased to exist. They no longer, no longer were there ten northern tribes. A little aside, I'm not going to dwell on this. In the 19th century, there was an idea, pure lunacy, called the British Israelite movement that claims that white people from northern Europe, particularly of Anglo-Saxon descent, are the remnant of the ten tribes of Israel. Well, phone me up or come round and see me. We'll have more time to sit and talk to you. Tell you here in the short version of this is rubbish, baloney, nonsense. I'll hold on to my tongue because I could say far worse about it. So there we are. God gives them warning. God actually gives them plenty of time. It's half a century before this is fulfilled in around the year 720 or 722, something like that. The Assyrians come. And God's prophecy through the shepherd of Tekoa, Amos, God's prophecy is true. And it comes to pass. I will do an epilogue to this study because I said I would do this. Next week we will look at what we understand to be the day of the Lord. That's how we think. Bless it, Lord. We thank you. There is always hope in the message. There's always the promise of restoration. There is always the light of salvation. And even where the words of judgment are proclaimed, and great doom and darkness is shown for the lack of repentance, yet hope is offered. We thank you, O Lord, that as we look at your word and we see the prophecies there, that hope for all humankind is held out before us in Christ Jesus our Lord, who was born, lived and died for us, is raised from the dead and sits at your right hand, Jesus our Saviour and Lord, light of the world, the salvation of all mankind. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.